A lesson from the first book of Samuel. First book of Samuel, therefore. Chapter 18 and verse 28. Chapter 18, verse 28, from the first book of Samuel. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore please be on, on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands, and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things, so Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was a war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life to tonight... Tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an, Im an image and laid it in the bed, and put a cover of goat's hair for his head, and covered it with clothes. So when Saul saw, sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the wet messengers had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naioth. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is Nioth, in, at Naioth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. 
Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah, and came to the great well that is at Shiku. So he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are in Naioth and Ramah. So he went there to Naioth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until, the, until he came to Naioth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all the day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Amen. Things are becoming more and more difficult for David, the man of God, because it is evident that God is with him, and this provokes the jealousy of other men, but it also provokes the hatred of the devil toward him. Saul tried in every way in an enemy in indirect in a direct way to kill David but he failed because every cunning trick that he tried God laughed at it and scoffed it and he turned it he God turned this cunningness and and evil desires and the attacks of uh, of Saul from a curse he turned them into a blessing and God has this Ability, and we, my dear brethren, must pray for this thing. Because God has the ability to change the curse into blessing, the evil into good, the illness to health. He is the one who brings perfect changes. And for that reason, it is extremely serious for the Christian to not fear. And especially to not fear the devil. The devil cannot do anything to us. He can't even touch us. Of course, since we are in the will of God, and in holiness, and in cleanness before God, he can do nothing to us. For that reason, don't say the devil did this, the devil did that. He can't do anything. But we have to believe this, because if we do not believe it, we give him room and he does do things we have to believe that he is vanquished what does Christ say I overcame and we are on the side of the victor the enemy cannot do anything to us when we believe what the Word of God says in detail because the one who dwells within us is a lot greater than the one who dwells in the world a lot greater The Lord of all hosts is living within you. Who can come and touch you? What do you think? No one has the authority to do this. No one has the power to do this. He can try tricks and cunning ways, but whatever he does, the Lord will bring it against him and in favor of the children of God. We have to realize this and comprehend it, that he is tied. That is how we must see him, like a dog, like a wild beast, We go into a park, let's say, and you see this animal, he is angry, he, he, he gnashes at teeth, he barks at you, but he's tied at a fence. He can't come close to you, but be careful, you mustn't approach him. This is the important thing. We mustn't go close to him. He can't approach us, he is tied. And don't be afraid of people or the devil. But what does Christ say? Fear not, believe only. And perfect love casts out fear. When you are afraid and you give importance to your enemy, it means that you don't love Christ a lot. Or you haven't realized and trusted the Word of God, which is absolute. We have authority to step upon serpents and scorpions and nothing to be able to harm us. We have authority to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you, Satan, leave from me, and he leaves, because we command him in the name of Jesus Christ. But don't go near him. 
Don't give room to the devil with your cunning thoughts and tricks, with transgressions and iniquities and sins. Not that God doesn't protect you then as well. God protects us always. But our security is in the Word of God, my dear brethren. When we do the things that are written, then we are in absolute safety. And this, you can tell this very clearly in the life of David. The things that the devil tried to do in his attempt to kill David, even though he knew that God had elected him, were unbelievable, but he failed. The fact that he um, makes plot, plots and plans against you, there's no doubt about it. If only we knew how Christ worked for us today so we can come to church just this day, we would give Him glory all day long. What the devil is striving to do is not let you through this door, to not let you go to your room and pray, for you to not open the Bible. What the devil is trying to do is hinder you from um, serving your brethren, but he can't obstruct you. He can't do anything. He is vanquished. Christ is the victor, though. And we are on the side of the winner. We have no strength to fight Him, but we have power to resist Him. Because what does the Bible say? He says, draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. What does I resist the devil mean? At every temptation, I do not fall. I pray and say, help me, Lord. I realize that this is a temptation. Because when I see my heart running towards something that I know God doesn't like, then at that moment, I have to understand that I am in a temptation. That he has cast his hook, he has cast his, his bait, so I can bite it. So every time that our heart, and we're talking from experience now, every time that our heart turns to something that God doesn't want, the Apostle James says this, Account it all joy when you fall into various temptations. At that moment you have power and authority to call upon the blood of Jesus Christ, and the grace of Jesus Christ, the mercy of Christ, and He will set you free. He will set you free, deliver you, and prosper you, and bless you. Because God cannot be tempted, nor does He tempt anyone. God has nothing to do with temptations. And since God does not have anything to do with temptations, I have His help in this thing, during the time of trial. He helps me. He protects me. So now David became the eternal enemy of Saul. Saul hated him. You know what this means? He never forgave him. But what matters is not if people are our enemies or if the devil is our enemy. What matters is if God is our friend or not. And in our days, Jesus Christ to be our friend. What does Jesus Christ being our friend mean? We have very good relationships with Him. He is not a stranger to us. And He's not because He has begotten us again. But let Him not be also a distant God. Who He may become a distant God to us if we neglect Him and forget Him and put Him aside. He never forgets us, of course. He is always waiting for us. He is faithful and He cannot deny Himself. He will never lose His faith. He will never disappoint you. He will never withdraw Himself from you. But He has one characteristic. He is waiting for you. He does not come to force you. He simply knocks on the door. Tick, tack, tack. Knock, knock, knock here. I am standing outside the door and knocking. And he's waiting to see, are you going to listen? Are you going to hear? <clears throat> and if you hear, then that's good. But if you do not, he will continue to knock until you hear. And we have to hear the, the knocking of Christ. <clears throat> and when you hear, will you open the door? If you hear and open the door there from then on, he's your friend. He is next to you. He's close to you. So close then no one else can be as close as he. You can go and tell him everything, and he will listen to you. 
He is a God who knows how to listen. You can go and tell him everything, and let us not confuse the things that the Bible says when he says, when you pray, do not speak, uh, take a long time praying. This he's talking about when we're all together. But later on he says, when you are praying, Go into your room and don't go out until you've told him everything. He's listening to you carefully, with great love, with great care. And not only Jesus Christ, but your Heavenly Father is listening to you, who has a very good habit. God reveals us His habits. He reveals Himself only in secret. Here we will see Christ revealing Himself, but our Father is revealed only in your room, in your prayer. Only there will, you come, will He come to reveal Himself to you. Only there will He come to show you His love. There's a nice story that I had heard, and I heard it today as well, and had it impressed me even more today. There were two young girls, and one young girl said to the other, they're around eight or nine years old. She said, we believe in God. And the other girl said, who is God? And she thought, our sister thought and said, I'll show you who God is. And she went to her room and she turned out the light. It was night time, turned off the light. The girl became afraid and started uh, shouting. She said, this is what God is, God is light. Isn't it nice? That is what God is, God is light. When God is with you, you're not afraid of everything, of anything. Everything is clear and open. When God is not with you, you are in darkness. This is a revelation. This is God's revelation. So this is what God is. God is light. And I, I still like this. I want to never forget this example here, because when we know that God is light, my dear brethren, we do not walk in darkness, ever. And we mustn't walk in darkness. And God does not want us to walk in darkness. You see how easily with God's revelation you can say with one word, what is God? So wherever David went, God prospered him because he behaved wisely. And Behaving wise is not a human ability, my dear brethren. Let's pay attention to this. There are people that are truly clever. They have an understanding of things. They're wise as well. They know a lot of things. They have read a lot of books. But we're not talking about this wisdom. Human wisdom. That many times is earthly, animalistic, sensual, and demonic. We are talking about a different wisdom, a wisdom from above. It has different characteristics. The wisdom that we are talking about here, is when some person has this wisdom, then he knows what the will of God is. Not that he has knowledge, much knowledge, but he knows what the will of God is. That's what the wise man knows. And the man of understanding knows how to behave in the presence of God and in his natural environment. The result being that God is pleased with him and he prospers him in whatever he does. This is the wisdom that we want. The wisdom of God that is from above. That is clean, that is holy, that is peaceful. Gives you fruit. You enjoy the favor of God. David may have not been a very educated general, for example, nor an experienced warrior. Goliath was an experienced warrior. A, a, an ed, an edu, uh, educated general was another man. But David knew from God how he could overcome Goliath, just with a swing and a rock. That young girl that we talked about earlier may have not been a theologian, but she knew in one word to say, to describe what God is. And this is the wisdom that we want, my brethren, wisdom from above. 
And furthermore, we must ask for it, because this heavenly wisdom, my dear brethren, cannot be compared to the earthly one. It has nothing to do with the earthly one. If some person thinks that he is wise, because he's clever, indeed, there are people who say that, they, they say that their IQ is very high. I have met people. Very few, but I've met such people who truly are especially clever. But this doesn't mean anything. This cannot mean a lot of things. This cannot reveal a lot of things spiritually. Because when we walk with our human wisdom, then we do whatever we think is right. We do whatever we judge to be right. But you know what our wisdom is? It's nothing. It's, it's zero. But the person who has the wisdom of God, he asks, and God reveals to him the things that only God knows, the beginning and the future and the end. So David was in safety here. When Saul saw that with cunningness he could do nothing, with his cunningness he could do nothing to him and his cleverness, then he said, I know what I'm going to do. I will kill him immediately. So he calls his officers, his servants, and he says, let's go to kill David. That's it. I've made my decision. He's alone there. He can't beat me. We will kill him. I've made this decision. I'm going to kill him. Jonathan heard this. Now, listen to how God uses people to save David. And whom will he use? Jonathan. Firstly. And then, Michal. Who are these people? Because God knows the future, He has trained them, He has prepared them, He has fixed their heart for that appointed time. And Jonathan says to David, Go, go, you are in danger. My father has decided to kill you. Go and hide for a while. I'll go and speak to him. And I believe that I'll be able to change his mind. And truly, David goes and hides. Jonathan says, but, but father, he goes to Saul, he says, My king, my lord, why do you want us to kill David? This man has done nothing bad to you. His works were very good toward you. He even took his life in his hands when he stood before the Philistine and killed him for Israel. And the Lord brought great deliverance to Israel through him. And you saw this and rejoiced. So why should you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? And look at these people. Saul was convinced, but he was convinced for a while. This is the characteristic of people who are not steadfast and immovable in the will and word of God, which thing God encourages us to be. Don't change your mind. Don't, don't change easily. Search to find what the will of God is and then stand on it, steadfast and immovable. Because a double-minded person this or that? Should I do this or should I do that? Should I go here or go there? Should, is this right or wrong? Well, stop, stop. A man who is double-minded is disorderly in all his ways. And whatever he decides to do. And all people are double-minded. Only one person isn't double-minded. The one who has guidance from God. The one who seeks the Lord. Now pay attention. It's not that I pray God listens to me and I will do and He will do whatever I told Him. No, that's not the matter. What matters here? I pray and I ask for God to tell me what I have to do. I'm not going to tell what God God what He has to do. God is going to tell me what I have to do. God will reveal to me, and I won't be afraid at all because, well, these people know that. He is and becomes a rewarder to those who seek Him only. Only by seeking God will God be your rewarder. There's no other way. 
And it's not that I will seek Him once and that's it. Because every time isn't the same. I will seek Him and continue to seek Him every time, every moment, every minute, whenever I find myself before the, the moment of making a decision. But every time. Otherwise, the wicked, that's what the Bible says, the wicked will be like a leaf that is taken by the wind, going this way and that way. But the godly is like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. Saul was disrespectful and wicked, and that's why he changes. He says this and that, or he changes his mind. Why should you kill him, says Jonathan. He says, you're right, I'm not going to kill him. So I bring him here. Okay, bring him. I've changed my mind. So he brings him in. Again, there was a war. Again, God favored David. And David now was living next to Saul like in the past. He, he played the harp and sang to Saul when the wicked spirit came upon Saul and, and troubled him. Why can't Saul be steadfast and immovable? Because he is affected by the devil. The devil deceives him. Remember what we said? Resist him and he will live. Th leave. Don't let him tempt you. Don't let him put thoughts in your mind, suggestions that are his. We don't want his proposals. We want the word of God. And don't say, this isn't bad. Don't say that. Is it bad? No, this isn't bad. Whatever is out of the word of God is not good. Whatever is out of the word of God. You do not have to try it. It may be wise, but it doesn't have human wisdom. It may be good, but it has human goodness. What we care about is the wisdom of God and the goodness of God. For that reason, when the wicked spirit came over to tempt him, it made him angry. And poor David was playing his harp, so he lifted the, the spear and tried to run him through with it. There David slipped aside again. It isn't easy for you to dodge. They were sitting next to each other. Only God could help David. So someone would dare say that he was given into Saul's hands with his goodness. He believed him. But God is protecting David. And so he moved aside and he, and he ran away. Saul got furious. He got furious. So he sent messengers to David's home so they can wait for him and kill him in the morning. He told them, go stand out in his house and as soon as you see him coming out of his house, kill him. Now the second person that God will use. I repeat on a beautiful verse. Among those who help me is the Lord always. Why does God say this? So that we do not feel obligated to the people who help us. We are obligated to God alone to give Him glory and thanks. We love them all, but let's not praise them. He came and helped me. He helped you, but it wasn't Him. It was the Lord through Him. <coughs> Let us not make anyone a God that the Lord has stirred up to help us and continue to help us. Let us, but neither if the Lord stirs us up to help someone should we expect rewards and thanks from them. It is not us who are helping, it is the Lord who is helping. We have to put this deep into our mind. Either people help us or we help others out. It isn't a man who is doing it, but it is Christ. And we give glory there to Him. And all gratitude and thanksgiving we give to Him alone. But to our brethren, we give them our kindness and our love. Oh, nothing to no one except to love one another. A lot worse thing than these things that I said now is when you help so you can win over his heart, his soul, to make him your friend so that he may come to your church, for example, so that he may be governed by you. Once I remember, we were in Australia. We had prayed 
And the Lord baptized a, a young girl in the Holy Spirit. She said, now, brother, I'm going to do whatever you tell me. I said, oh, you're in trouble if you say that. If you do whatever I tell you. First of all, because you think that I baptized you. And secondly, because you'll be in trouble, my sister. But it is very serious, my dear brethren. When you are able to help someone, you must know that God has given you the ability. And the ability isn't from us, it is from God. For that reason, you must give glory to God and never claim the gratitude of people toward you. You must give glory to God together. And when they help you, don't say, oh, look at that, he's such a good man, well done to him, may the Lord bless him. We'll say that, yes. But say also that he who helps me is Jesus Christ. Among those who help me is the Lord. He has opened my heart, their heart. And he opens our heart as well and we help. And it is good when we help that no one knows about it. Don't go and help him out in the open with any way, but try to help him in that way that he does not know which man is the one who helped him, so that without fear and any problem to give glory to the Lord of hosts. God used Jonathan. Now it was the time for him to use Michal. This is why God laid heart, uh, love in the heart of Michal for David. That is why he gave her to be his wife. She, with any other woman, Saul would have gotten to him and killed him, except Michal. You see how serious it is, my dear brethren, for us to choose God's election for us, for us to desire the will of God for us. You see how serious it is? If he had said, well, you know, I don't really like Michal. She's like this and like that. And he had taken a different wife. Saul would have killed him. For that reason, let us take the gifts of God. But we must be sure that they are the gifts of God. We mustn't refuse the gifts of God. We, we must be sure. And how will we be sure? through our prayer, with our seeking the face of God, with our course. Michal goes and says, If you do not leave tonight, you will never escape. Tomorrow morning they will kill you. And what does Michal say? She says, Now go. And she goes to his bed. She sets up a, a, a doll. He puts him down. He hangs him. She... Lowers him down outside the window, and David escaped. The messengers came, and they said, well, I want David. She said, ah, he's sick. They go and say to Saul, he's sick. Well, go, even if he's sick, bring him here on his bed so I can kill him. I don't kill healthy people only, I kill the sick people as well. This is what the devil does. He's a murderer from the beginning. So they went, they searched, and they found an image. They found this doll that Michal had built. Saul goes furious. He went to Michal and said, what are you doing there? Why did you send my enemy away? Listen to how he sees him. And this is very serious. This is how Saul sees David. He sees him as his enemy. But David isn't an enemy. Saul is the enemy of David. This is how the devil sees us as his enemies. We have nothing against them. We love Christ. We have nothing with his children. We want Christ to save them. We want to have peace with all men, but also sanctification without which no one will see the face of God. Why did you save my enemy? Michal told a small, a small lie because she said because I was afraid of him he threatened me now here is a sign that is very important a man of God does not produce fear Michal was afraid of her father and out of fear she said he told me that he would kill me if I did not let him go and that's why I let him go a man of God does not produce fear in another man when you produce fear in another person, you're not in the will of God. The person of God produces respect and love. He brings joy. He brings blessing. 
when your children look at you and they're afraid that you're going to strike them on the head, you failed as a father. For that reason, the mothers do not support fear in the heart of the children toward their parents and strengthen the respect toward their parents, not fear and trembling. You are not a good father when your parents, when your children see you and tremble, afraid you might beat them to death, tear their ears off. You failed as a, as a, as a father if you do this. And God has given us a beautiful recipe for the parents that we must always know and always keep in mind. When they are infants, the children are in innocence like during the age of Adam till Noah. There, there is innocence in the child. Whatever you do, he loves you. It loves you. But when he, she enters the, end, the baby stage, what does the Word of God say? From a very young age, from a baby's age, the heart of man is filled with evil. From three to six years old, maybe seven years old, there you have to uh, in inspire righteousness in them. Like from the Noah to Abraham, the time of righteousness. Until the years, until it's six or seven years old, the child can understand righteousness. Have you? He wants things to be fair. Did you put more milk in that cup that isn't mine, or less? He wants everything to be fair. If you want to win over your child, show how righteous you are, how fair you are. But the fairness of God that forgives, that loves. When the age of your child changes and he enters the, the age of a child, let's say seven years old till 13, there the, the child is, has an advantage and he wants this and, and, and he seeks it and, and you can take advantage of this. He believes you. He has faith. For that reason, do not lie to him. At the age of a baby, do not wrong him. You will lose your, his trust. You will lose his, his respe your respect. Better to wrong yourself than you wrong the child. But when he's in a, a, a child's age, do not lie to him. Because the child believes you. And if, you sees, if he sees that you have lied, then he rejects you. He loses his trust in you. I remember lately, my, my grandson, when I told him a small lie, I told him, tell you what lie. I told him, I'll search in your, let me look in your armpits so I can bring out some chocolate. He said, you're lying. There's no chocolate in my armpit. You don't lie to your children, not even for a joke. Especially to the age when they are children and they're 7 to 13. You only will win them over when you tell them the whole truth. Don't think that they don't understand the truth. They understand the truth very well. Never lie to your child. You will lose it. Of course, when they enter the age of teenagers, 13 to 18, well, then it's very difficult. There you need law. You need discipline there. So the child at an age of infancy, it learns righteousness. At the child's age, it, uses, it uh, learns faith. And in teenage years, you have to teach them discipline. There must be laws and order. And don't be afraid. They say, let the children free. No, not free. Not unrestrained. If you leave them unrestrained, they will go. You set some boundaries to your children when they're teenagers. The parents and the church, but especially the, the parents. You will hold them with law. Law of love, of course, and righteousness and faith. But be careful. Law has rewards. God says, if you do all of my commandments, you will be blessed. There's no law without reward. There must be law with reward. If you do the things that I will tell you, then I will do this for you. In other words, a reward. Rewards. And the child will know that it will it will fight for something, but it will win it. After 18, well, then we've entered the age of grace because we found grace.
in the eyes of God. You and Him. Only grace from God. You can't do anything from there on. You did everything, whatever God told you, and now you're expecting God to show mercy and grace to your child and to you, to our children, all of them, so that they may go well in their life. And you see that when the child has grown up this way, many times in the age of a teenager they stand up, but as soon as they finish high school, they change completely. They get in line. What happens? Their dispensation has changed. But everything depends on the father and the mother. This is very serious for us to know at every age what we have to do. And only God can show us this. If you go to psychologists and child psychologists, they'll make you mad. And they'll say, Tuberous, when I came home to my house, after I'd left it, and I saw the problems that my children had because I had divorced with my wife, I said, I'll go to a child psychologist. A child psychologist. My son Dina was very aggressive. He was hard. He was a very difficult young man when he was still a child. So I went to the child psychologist and he said, well, this child needs to learn sword fighting. I said, what? He needs sword fighting. Why? So that he can learn discipline. I said, and if you don't, and if you can't give him uh, sword fighting, give him yoga. I said, yoga? I'll leave. I got rid of him then. Child psychologists will make him make you mad. Psychiatric clinics are mad, with, crazy with people that have been made mad by psychologists. I'm not talking about diseases here and illnesses. If there's an illness, you go to the hospital, the soul or the body. You go to the hospital, of course. But I'm talking about the people that we make mad. You know how easy it is for you to make a man, a person mad? Go and tell him it's night outside while it's day. And add another two and three, say, it's night time. Well, they stay. Take another person and tell them, it's night time. You'll make him mad. You think it's night time? And I'm confused? Everyone is saying this. This isn't a joke. This is a method of making a person mad that different politicians did in various dictatorships. If you want to make a person mad, it's an easy thing to do. But what matters is for you to turn him to the Word of God. But first, we will turn to the Word of God. He looks for David, he can't find him anywhere. He asks around, he said, Ah, oh, he's gone to Samuel. Poor David didn't have anywhere to go. Have you ever found, been found in the situation of not knowing where to go? If you are in the situation, go to the man of God. You hear this? When you come to weakness and not know what you have to do, and not know what, where you have to go, and not know how you ought to progress, go to the man of God. David knew what to do because he had wisdom and understanding from the Lord. So he went to Samuel. He is the man who will understand you. He is the man who will listen to you. And he is the man who can and wants to help you. He wants and he is able to help you. He wants to because he has love and he can because he has the power of God with him. For that reason, the best hospital is the church. You know that? The best hospital, there's no better hospital than the church in the body, soul and spirit. Like the best school, university, is the church. Why? Because in the university, the school that is the church, you learn the will of God, the wisdom of God. It is a hospital. And it heals anything that is not good in the eyes of God. But it is also an army camp. He trains you so that you may know how to fight and in reality to know how to overcome. There are three things that the church has. It's a school, a hospital, and a camp. A school where Christ is the teacher. A hospital where doctor is Christ. 
in a camp where the general and king is Christ the Lord. That is where you will find peace. And David went to Samuel. And where did Samuel take him? He took him to the mountain of the Lord for prayer. When people come to you because you are a man of God, you know where you must take them to prayer. Don't make you bring your forth your own wisdom to say how we must do. You must do this or that. I know what you have to do. They don't know. Every condition, every occasion is different, and the only one who knows indeed is God. Someone says, "Let's go pray." He has no weapons, but he has the power of the Holy Spirit. And they went straight to prayer. Is he safe there? Yes, of course. Why? Because God is with him. God is defending him. Saul says, well, I got him now. So he sent soldiers and they, and they said, go and bring him here. They went near. As soon as they went near, they got filled in the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Look at the weapons that God has. They stood there and they prophesied. When Saul saw this, he sent others. When the others went, they also prophesied. Third time, they also prophesied. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. But Samuel doesn't have weapons. He doesn't have anything. God is with him. When we have nowhere to go, we must go to our brothers. They may not have the necessary things to help, help us according to men, but God is with them. They have God with them. In the end, Saul says, everyone is useless. I'm going to go and get him on my own. That's what people say. Do I have to do everything? Are you all useless? But the man of God does not say this, ever. The man of God says, God will do everything. And you are all very good. You are all very blessed. I am an empty tin can. You see completely different philosophy and mind frame so he goes to catch him and as soon as he goes in he prophesies as well but he prophesies in a special way he strips himself naked he embarrasses himself in other words and he reigned naked all that day prophesying the others were clothed and with a sound mind but he prophesied naked and stripped. Why? Because God revealed his nakedness. The man of the world, no matter how many armors he wears, is naked. He is naked. You can see the reproach, the nakedness. And pay attention to what the devil does. He, na he, he strips them. I went out today, I don't know, went somewhere at noon, it was hot. All the women were naked. Up, bottom, left, right. They were all naked. I said, what's going on? The devil strips them. You see someone up to here. If they bow down a bit, just you, that's it. If they walk faster, just a bit. He makes them all naked. Why? Because they are naked. They have nakedness in them. Why was Saul naked, became naked? Because he had nakedness in his heart. He is not clothed. He is not, does not have a sound mind. May God keep us, my dear brethren, so that we may be clothed and wise with understanding. Amen. It is sad to see young girls in the, on the road and I can't understand their stomach outside, their top outside, their, their legs out, out in the open. Why did they do this thing? And I received the answer here when I was reading. The devil strips them because they are naked in their heart. Nakedness comes forth when it is inside. When there is no nakedness inside, it doesn't come forth. For that reason, when people come into the church, they're naked, and slowly, slowly, the Lord begins to dress us up, and He makes us, and adorns us, and gives us beauty. 
but a beauty that is heavenly. And the husband looks at his wife and he's proud of her, if you can say this. And the woman looks at her husband and she is proud of him. And the husband knows that he can only see this woman. Not everyone sees this woman that way. We thank God, my dear brethren, for the Church of Christ. We thank God. We thank God for our wives, for our children, for your husbands. But most of all, we thank God for Christ who is among us. Amen.